Hi, it's Ileana here, and this is Awakening Cosmic Reality Show, and tonight we have Meta with us. Hi, Meta. Hello, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I've had a rough week, but uh, it's been very productive. I've got a lot done. Good, good. And Meta is a secret space program insider who was and still might be with the Dark Fleet. Um, so are you currently with Dark Fleet or uh, is is this now for you? You're out of the programs. Well, I mean, when I was sent back, I was expected to forget everything and I had been abducted for years after I returned. So I know I'm not part of the Dark Fleet anymore. Um, they were never able to actually remove all of my memories, and um, I did not respond well to the programming during abduction, so it never really worked. And I always had memories of the abductions, and that eventually led back to my memories of what happened before the abductions. Uh, so I'd have to say no, I'm definitely not part of the Dark Fleet and so, anymore. Okay, so what were your memories before the Dark Fleet? Well, I was only four years old um, when it all occurred. So my my memories before my, I've been able to trace my memories back now to all the way till I was eight months old, and um, I can trace my memories back pre life for very 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 far. But that's not in this life. Okay, and how do you go about tracing your memories back to when you were 18 months old and even your other lifetimes? Is there a specific technique you use? What do you do? Um, well, there's, uh, there's a particular set of techniques I use, but primarily for past life regression, um, I usually go into a meditative state before I go to sleep. And then um, I'm very good at lucid dreaming and remembering my dreams. And um, in those dreams, I'm able to trace certain connections because the, the, the only way you can ever trace your, pre your previous lives back is by the synchronistic events in this life and how those pertain to your previous mistakes and experiences with other people. And um, so you have to use those as guides and precursors uh, to make it back to where you were before so you understand the relationships you had with uh, other people before in other situations before this life. Interesting. And um, do you remember which group or faction were you in when you were with Dark Fleet? Um, are you talking about um, what group or faction? As I mean, for me, I was I was not given a lot of intel about anything because of my specific situation. I was. Uh, after a period of time, I was allowed to kind of sidestep a lot of the rules of the ship, but that meant that I received very little intel about anything and that most people were punished for even talking to me or, or interacting with me or interacting with others around me. So it was, it was a different situation than most people. And what kind of a situation was it, if you can briefly describe that, please? Well, I was a, a portal operator and a time travel operative primarily, and so uh, we had a we had a, for me anyways. I had a suit that I could travel through a, a portal to another place as long as I was given uh, a visual of that place, and um, it, it linked up to my suit, and I was able to create a portal to move there. Um, and usually I would come in in like a stealth situation, assess it, and then I would be able to activate portals from my suit that would bring other people there. They were waiting, ready to move through a portal after I'd went through my own. Um, and then uh, the time travel situations, most of those were dependent upon earlier missions and uh, much later missions. Um, and they, they kind of... Uh, they kind of kept it that way because it could change the course of battle. Um, but they, they allowed me to keep my time travel abilities later on, even though they weren't as important because uh, calling people forward into battle and then being able to slow down certain things while they finish what they were doing was really important. So is it true that you could flash freeze time 
itself to stop situations? That's not accurate. I've, uh, I've tried to say that a bunch of times. It's not accurate because it's not that I could flash freeze time. I could flash freeze time within a small sphere. Um, or I could flash freeze time with inside a human body, a physical body. And it wasn't alien bodies necessarily, but I was able to do it within certain people who held the genes of my physical, uh, of, you know, of my species. Okay. I could freeze time just for them inside of them. But that wasn't for all aliens everywhere. That, and it, other than that, I could freeze time or reverse or fast forward time later in my career. Um, but it was only with inside spheres or bubbles, if you will. Okay. And so was the suit sort of like a smart suit technology with nanotech in it, nanotechnology? Oh, my God, yes. Um, and eventually, uh, the, it, like, it was probably about the fifth generation suit. Um, they finally decentralized the power system, and that's when it went exponential. That's when things beca everything became uh, effortless. Um, but, uh, yeah, up until then, there was a, a power system located along the spine, along with uh, a reinforcing kind of agility strength thing. But, uh, well, it, it prevented me from using my abilities to a test degree. Okay, so maybe like a exoskeleton and then the smart suit over it, sort of like that? Yes, yes, and um, then eventually around the fifth generation, we moved to just a smart suit that was um, beyond comparison. Um, my smart suit had the ability, it, it would uh, expand over my head completely, and it was its own helmet. Um, it could be at my neck level, or it could be wrapped with an level around my face or it could expand across my face and give me like a, a normal helmet visor view of you know what of the other soldiers used with a helmet interesting but it had special it has special things like for targeting and stuff like that especially with my abilities it was important to have those things linked to the suit because it amplified my abilities the whole suit did so you could with your abilities you could do time travel you could open portals for teleportation is that correct Yes, as long as I had a reference of where I was going or when I was going, um, I could do that. And did you have any other abilities? Um, there were some other abilities. Uh, there were, there were uh, some of those uh, techniques became weaponized over time. I was able to create tiny portals. In the very beginning, I only had the ability to send something to a white dimension or a black dimension. And that's where it progressed from. Um, and so in the beginning, I was supposed to destroy these drones in this training program and it wouldn't work. And I, they were threatening to send me back. And to me, that was very fearful at that time. And, um, I made them disappear and it, it, it upset them. They were not happy. And I thought I would had done something amazing and it upset them. But, um, we came to realize that I was either sending them to the, to a altruistic dark dimension or altruistic light dimension. And then uh, through that progress, I eventually began to home a skill so that I could move to places or times or both. And um, then after that, then I went back to my roots and realized that it could also be used as a weapon to create a bunch of small portals with inside one physical object that would basically rip it apart. So eventually, yes. And when we were uh, talking a little bit, um, you said you had spent most of your time with the Dark Fleet out on ships? Yes, correct. Um, probably for the first three to four years, we stayed within the solar system. During that time, I cut my teeth on these heroic missions where I saved people from being killed in different ways. Some of them accidents, some of them by uh, assassins. And... Um, I had this really built up altruistic view of myself as being uh, a savior and a very good person. And then they started throwing me into these missions where all we were really doing was just uh, raiding ships and taking them. Yeah. So it was your time is mostly spent in outer space and not on planets, not dirt side, as they would say. Well, no, I didn't live ever on dirt side, except for the uh, excursions I took in between missions through time dilation. Um, but, uh, I was one of the only people on the ship that could talk or return to earth. And so in that respect, I had more earth time than anyone. 
So you, through the time travel, you could exist in concurrent timelines? Is that how you returned to Earth? Or they just allowed you to have time off from missions and do your Earth life? Um, the, the, real, the reality is, is that for the first, let's say about three, three and a half years, my missions were all built around saving elite children from death in different ways or teenagers um and uh so the missions were actually built around i met the elites that had employed me in three different places to do these for do these jobs for all different people and uh so i re i returned to save all these children i was given a mission i was given a time and a place and there was a giant oh uh, there was a giant circle that had it's like a looking glass and into the past and through that i could see where i was going i had the choice to create my own portal to show up exactly where i wanted or to jump in from the looking glass portal and um that happened for about three and a half years and this will this was saving children and adolescents on earth or um other planets as well Mostly Earth. I, I don't remember any other planets. If they were, they looked so similar to Earth, I couldn't tell the difference. And you had also mentioned that you had been on a pirate ship and that there was a crew? Oh, yes. No, that was after those three and a half years. Um, um, and, you know, uh, understand that I had went through training for almost a year and a half, two years before that. So that was five years after I'd left the Earth. Um, but... Uh, um, and I can't, I mean, like, I'm pretty sure it was a different ship than the original ship, but there was so many similarities, it wasn't much different. Um, I can remember that when we, uh, after we finished and we graduated, some left and then the rest of us stayed. And then after that, um, we each split up and we moved to other ships. So I'm pretty sure it wasn't the same ship. Um, but uh, it was very similar. Uh it, there were some larger areas, like it felt like the training area was larger because training never stopped. So, um, Meta, can you describe some of the ships that you had been on, that primary ship, what the configuration is, what the engines were like, the shape, uh, the technology on the ship, if you could, please? Okay, well, I mean, the ship that I went to the moon on when I first uh, left Earth um, – and I mean, you can check back with the Adonis interviews, but um, I was moved from where I lived to another place. I was age progressed, and then uh, I entered a hangar room where I left on uh, a ship that was similar to TR-3B, and uh, one of them good old black triangle ships. And um, uh, we went to the moon where I spent maybe less than three hours in an office-like room signing papers. And uh, uh, keep in mind, I was a four-year-old that had been transferred to an 18, 21-year-old body at this point. So I wasn't really very obstinate. Um, and then I entered a ship that was like uh, almost like an arrowhead version of the TR-3B. But it had uh, four points. And um, it was longer, but much thinner than a TR-3B. And then that ship docked on one uh, that had a, uh, it was, it, it was like, it was, it was very similar to the one that I, that I had traveled there on, but it was much larger. And it had these uh, extraneous uh, uh, kind of thrusters strutting out the side, halfway down the sides on each side. So was it was the propulsion system anti gravity technology? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, it, it had a uh, the the propulsion in the back had a a blue hue to it, um, but uh, at the same time, it 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 had a form of gravity plating uh, that uh, that allowed you to walk on the inside as if it was regular gravity. Um, it, they had a, a, a holographic training uh, room, and they also had uh, uh, all sorts of other much higher than normal technologies. Um, and they did have a way to travel at, at, at light or faster than light speeds, when I, even when I first uh, was on the ship. So, yes, I would assume so. 
So basically the engines probably were beyond even the plasma technology or the mercury and gold type of technology that uh, some anti-grav ships are have on for the engine systems, would you say? Yes, I got the feeling like they used that for uh, l lower than the uh, light of speed uh, travel, um, but uh, that they had some type of technology that just allowed them to kind of blip from one place to another. I mean, it, it, now keep in mind that uh, that was very limited in the beginning and that over time, getting around six, seven years in, it became much more exponential to the point that uh, by the time I was 12 years in, they were thinking about moving to other galaxies. Okay, so maybe they use crystalline technology for um, even for the engine systems. Like this, I know Dark Fleet ships have very advanced engine systems that go beyond rocket propulsion, go beyond plasma, lithium, thorium, beyond See, mercury and gold. About that. I know nothing about any of that. Um, that was not my area of expertise. So, uh, you know what I mean? Like, I'm stretching on that part. I know how far we traveled and how fast we traveled in different situations. but Or how quickly they can make an order to travel. Because that would happen very quickly also. But um, I don't necessarily know the technologies that were involved. Okay. Um and how long had you been on the pirate-like ship, and what was involved in that? Well, honestly, um, I feel like as soon as those three and a half years were up, um, I spent any... It depends. It's, it's a really odd situation, because if you count the number of years that I was there and or uh, time dilating back to Earth, and I still don't know for sure whether or not they let me do that or I did it on my own, um, but, um, it seems like no one was the wiser every time I did it. But, uh, if you count all of those, then it, it was almost 40 years. And then there were multiple nodal, there were two, there were two nodal points, uh, after I left of which I had a time nexus where multiple versions of me interacted. And so if you combine all that knowledge, it's a lot more. But in average, I say about 18 to 20 years, just if you just count the time I was there, uh, about 40 years, if you count the times that I, I, I uh, time delayed back to Earth, and God knows how many years, if you count all the blendings I had in the nexus points. And, and so basically, sometimes what can end up happening with the time travel, you could see multiple versions of yourself and multiple alters of yourself, perhaps, like you just said, with the time nodules, right? Yes, especially since many different versions you had the ability to uh, traverse time and space. There are times where extremely important moments occur and you're making decisions and versions of you come decide to all come back to communicate to you warnings and experiences so that you can then make better choices from that point forward. And in those situations, if you all work as one in unity, then everything is copacetic and all the timelines converge upon you. And if you're in conflict, if different versions of you are choosing to go in different directions, then the timeline splits. Um, when you were on the pirate ship, what was the intimate interpersonal relationships like with women? Um, because I know for, in Dark Fleet, they sometimes pair you up and arrange your marriages and stuff like that, or you have handlers for partners. What was that like for you? I had a handler as a partner uh, that was the same handler the whole time. Um, there were other uh, shipmates that did get involved sexually with us from time to time. Um, but for the most part, it was a, it, it, looking back on it now, I can tell that it was kind of a system to uh, extract um, psychosomatic energy from me uh, for other projects. Um, and because when I think where things were placed on the ship, um, I know that, uh, like, er, there was a, like one of the portal rooms with the large looking glasses that 
I was given my reference points from was right above my own bedroom, was right above my own quarters, you know, so and then, um, looking back, I could tell that something else was going on there. And the handlers, the, the female ones that you might have been intimate with, they were like a wife and a mother to you, that kind of way? Only one was like a wife and a mother. Everyone else was kind of like a maid or a helper or part of a, you know. It, they had specific, some of them had specific uh, things they wanted to do, specific uh, uh, combinations, if you will, situations in that respect. Um, and, uh, but for, most of the time, they were the helpers, and they would only get involved towards the end. Okay. Uh, were you guys allowed to have children and families on the ship if you wanted, or was it strictly like you do your work, you have your intimate uh, relationships, and but you can't have children and family? Never once. I never, I never saw that happen. Okay. So basically, you could partner up intimately, but you weren't allowed to have family. Well, and, and most were not. Most were not allowed to partner up at all. Um, okay. And, and, and uh, in fact, a severe punishment. And what were the uh, severe punishments like? What did they do to you guys if you misbehaved or did something against the rules? Well, something occurred for me much earlier when I froze my ship like that uh, in that I was able to bargain in a way, negotiate uh for my own freedom a little bit more than most. Um, but most people were severely tortured. Um, and um, if they couldn't be rehabilitated to their personal uh, approval, they'd be jettisoned from the ship. But, uh, go ahead. So that was the punishment, basically. You're either demoted or you're totally jettisoned out of the ship if you're like misbehaving or if you're not able to negotiate stuff for yourself right yeah if you have no predatory power because you know that's how that system was i did not have to believe in that system especially since a lot of the energy i used didn't come from a predatory situation uh it made no sense for me to have to believe that in fact it was almost counterproductive um but for most people it was a system that was imposed upon them Okay. And how did the promotions and the demotions work? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, it was pretty much, you know, a uh, higher officer to, uh, I mean, okay, so let's, the, what, what they called the workshop for me was basically a tech room where they would adjust my suits and do different things that honestly were almost like torture to me. And, um, uh, I watch people get demoted from there from not wanting to do what they were told to do. Um, and some of my favorite people who worked uh, in the scientific labs, the workshop, uh, were uh, destroyed or removed or knocked down to some type of custodial duty, but finally they were finally jettisoned. Um, and, um, you know, uh, that, that's just... Uh, the area that I saw it happen in the most. I watched it happen to soldiers. Um, I was only allowed to enjoy uh, food, food with others several times, two or three times over all the years. And I watched people get punished uh, for talking about things I was not supposed to know about there. Um, and uh, I mean, it was, it was, it was a very quick road. You might have one rung before you were jettisoned. Okay. When I, I, I briefly was um, assigned to the one of the dark fleet cities outside the solar system, and I remember somebody's um, a dark fleet asset's hands being cut off and then electrocuted and then reattached, and then he was they were desensitized to pain thresholds so they could withstand a lot of different pain and not break so easily. Like that was one of the punishments. Yeah, the first thing they would do is most of us were set with this uh, these double metal bars that were put on the right side of our neck, and they monitored your thoughts, and it was kind of like a thought police system, where if you thought things that some AI system did not like, you would get pretty darn shocked. It would it, Some people, it was so visceral, you would throw up, and... Um, 
this what they would do when you went into an interrogation situation they would put another one on your on your left side and then they would put a collar around that and then they would start to ask questions and this created so much pain in your whole body that like you you would pass out at the end of it but then it it had the ability to wake you right back up perfectly and then they would move on to things like cutting your hands off and uh you know uh burning up the end so you didn't bleed out and uh different versions of that with other parts of your body and um uh dealing with the most sensitive parts of your area uh, there were several spots around your hip that uh, were extremely painful and also uh, charged your lower chakras in a way that uh, encouraged you to say the right things, I guess. I don't know how it worked, but um, yeah, no, it, it was pretty severe. Yeah, and then I, I remember like when the hands were cut off, like you would see blood coming out from the detached hands and from the limbs. <laughs> And that was to shock you. So when your hands were... They'd make you watch that. They'd yeah. make you watch that part. And then they would take they would take it and they would shock it until it burnt. And it was not going to bleed anymore right before you died. Yeah. And then, like, I remember some people didn't die. They Their hands were reattached. And, and you were told that's going to be your punishment forever on end. And we can revive you through the regeneration tanks and the different goos the green goo uh right. blue goo. Yep. um and they were told like if you misbehave if you don't cooperate with the orders that you're given as a dark fleet asset that will happen to you or you'll be infested with different archon type entities into your brain and you'll watch your soul is there but you can't do anything you're present but you can't do anything you can't control your body. That archonic entity controls you. And it's going right. to do the most horrific missions, the most disgusting things. And when it leaves you, you're going to be left broken and uh, feel a lot of guilt. But that's your punishment for misbehaving. You're not cooperating. Right. And I'd say about 80% of the people on my ship had the black AI goo inside of them. Um, it was part of a ritual they did. Um so most of them had that, and those that had it very rarely made a mistake. Um, everyone else still had empathy, was required to have the empathy for some reason, were the ones that got punished. And did you see a lot of German uh, officers, soldiers during your time in the Dark Fleet? Um, it was pretty much a mixture for the reg regular soldiers. There was a... Um, a group of Nordic people that smoke uh, some German, but also uh, some older Nordic language, um, <clears throat> uh, blonde hair, blue eyed. They had weapons and technology they didn't share with others. Um, and so it was, I don't know. They, I, I got the feeling they looked at it more like a fishing expedition than an actual, you know, I don't know. It was, it was an odd group of people. But they were always the ones to clean up the messes. They were the best at it. And, like, um, do, you, do you have some German ancestry on your side? Uh, on, on back on my father's side, I do. Okay, because I heard that they're specifically looking for assets with some German background and, and DNA and ancestry. Yeah, it's a possibility, but I've been fairly well blended since then i'm pretty much a mutt when you look at my ancestry i'm all over the place from english to irish to american indian uh so um in addition to german um so it i i can't put it on one thing and you know my blood type is uh ab positive um i've had several o negatives in my recent past uh all of them mothers but um the, uh i'm probably like the first generation that is ab positive from uh two o negative grandmothers or something like that and what is the meta gene the meta dna well the meta gene is something that we all have um it doesn't matter about your blood type in particular um, everyone has it. It's a, one of the codons that hasn't been activated yet. Um, but it is something that allows you to redefine reality. 
And um, it's kind of like what we do when we do mass meditations. It activates the metagene in a way where uh, all of us are co-creating a future possibility at the same time. Someone who has a fully activated metagene can affect other people's metagenes uh, in a very profound way. Um, I honestly think that was how I was able to freeze my ship, was that I had an activated metagene. And they've been talking about it for a little while, um, but they, they, were, they were scared to talk about it the whole way. They wouldn't, it was like this great secret. I'd, they wouldn't tell me the whole uh, reality of um, but when your metagene is fully activated, you can create a physical reality. You can create physical objects. You can rewrite reality. Um, <clears throat> you can move through time and space. Um, you can do all these things. And um, uh, for me personally, my ability to move through time and space uh, was amplified. And I think the others were kind of diminished um, in the suits I was put in. Um, but uh, knowing more about it now and uh, piecing together the different conversations I had up there, I'd have to say that um, that's what it's really all about, is that this metagene is able to communicate uh, collectively throughout our entire species. But at the same time, uh, when it's fully activated, we can, uh, we, we can create our own realities with it. And what does the word meta stand for itself? Uh, the word meta, it, it really stands for a, uh, a connectedness, like an internetwork of uh, creative potential. Uh, it gives us the ability to uh, recreate our uh, uh, realities. Hmm. That's very interesting because I've, I've had people asking me, where, what does the word meta mean? Why does this insider, why did they choose the meta uh, to introduce themselves as meta? So that's interesting. It's really funny because I did not choose the name because it was connected to that gene process. I chose the name because um, I've had three different communications over time with Metatron. Um, okay. And um, I'm, I'm not a channeler. I am a, a experiencer in that I I travel to other realms, even to this day, and I communicate with different entities, um, and I bring back information and little jewels of what I'm taught, and that's about it. So it's not per se channeling, but what is it then? Oh, I, I just think of it as a uh, a meeting, uh, like a, a a meeting where. I'm a student and they're a teacher. Um, and uh, I mean, keep in mind, uh, two of the three meetings I've had with Metatron required Ascended Masters just to translate because he was there. It was very he, he was so advanced. It was there was so much information that it was very hard to understand him. Very interesting information. Um do you, do you feel like sometimes you're still pulled into like temporary missions with Dark Fleet or any other of the secret space program factions? Yes, I've uh, as of recent, I can count three different times I've been pulled into missions. Um, some of them for, and I, I do interact with quite a bit inner Earth factions in uh, those uh, situations we're talking about. I've had two interactions with inner earth factions recently and one where I was obviously taken upon a ship. Um, and I've gotten confirmation of that from other people in our, uh, groups that had extremely similar dreams around the same time. And, um, although I went a little bit further into the experience than they did, they stopped early. Um, I was able to talk more about what happened uh, once they put us to task, if I will. And, um, I'd have to say that the, the one that was off planet was kind of benign. It was almost like a terraforming situation, uh, where we were expected to get, we were expected to give care while building a, uh, a building of some sort. And we had, uh, multiple automatons we were directing, and using specific amounts of energy while we are doing so not to overwhelm a system. Um, and the two inner 
Earth uh, experiences revolved more around preparing uh, specific places and caverns uh, for habitation and um, uh, reanimation. There's a lot of automation underneath the surface that has to do with ancient buildings that has been dormant for a long time that is becoming active now. What would you say is the secret space program? How would you describe it? And what are some of the factions if you know about them? Oh my gosh. Um, and, and keep in mind, I don't have a lot of information about other factions. Um, I have a lot of information about uh, different alien groups we captured. I have information about uh, uh, different um, planets that we put outposts and homesteaded on. I have information about the raids that I was involved with. Um, but as far as different factions, I do not know a whole lot about. Um, but if I had to guess, I would say that it's probably as diverse as the life on the Earth. Um, and what 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 is the information that you know about the different aliens or extraterrestrials? You said you have some information, like what kind of species? Oh, gosh. Well, primarily our group was uh, uh, mostly interested in humanoid bipedal uh, aliens. Um, there were a couple of more. Uh, there were a couple of like gel-like aliens that they were extremely interested in. But everything else was a bipedal. And um, they primarily used them in a slave trade. Um, it was it was all about extraction of information and then <clears throat> physical domination and vampirism. And what kind of planets uh, do you have information about? Oh gosh, uh, well we inhabited planets from um, mostly ice planets to mostly jungle planets uh, to desert planets. Uh, many different asteroids. Um, they had spread through a good portion of the galaxy before we even left this galaxy. And um, you could, it, it just about any biome you could imagine, they created some type of uh, uh, port at. And uh, predominantly, the plan was to just spread so far and so quickly and um, is so completely that we could never be completely removed. And what kind of homesteading did you do or planetary colonization? Most of it was, for me anyways, was scouting. Um, there would be times where I would just spend a week straight just visiting different planets and um, uh, kind of surveying them for uh, possible habitation by... Um, our dark fleet groups. And, um, I got the feeling that they received large compensation for producing this list, if you will, almost like they could lay a flag on it and claim it and then sell it to another group. Hmm. Um, and that's why they were more than happy to let me do it for a little while because it produced a lot of money for them. Um, but at the same time, it, it allowed them to keep a list of all the planets that they had uh, uh, had recorded. And so therefore they might sell it to another group and then wait five years. And then after they had produced a nice large outpost, come back and take it over. And, and um, after receiving, you know, most of the, most of the compensation for selling it in the first place. And do you, and, go ahead. Sorry. No, you go ahead. You were going to finish that sentence oh, and, or thought. And, right. And so in that respect, like even even the interactions with other uh, secret space programs was very cutthroat. Do you remember what kind of uh, uniform you wore or suits or what colors it was? Was it form fitting, shape, any type of stuff like that? For the most part, it was just that, like, I almost never got out of that damn suit. Um, and, I mean, it was also used to control me. It was also used, it could be, it could lock me down, it could knock me out. Um, and there were ways for me to bypass that in different situations. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, it was pretty much just that black suit for me. Um, 
uh, they did have a, a navy blue fatigue that I would wear over the top sometimes, uh, but most of them were black. And the, the suit, did it have the ability to monitor and, and also control your the molecular structure of your body? So while you were wearing the suit, you would not make any bio waste to go to the bathroom? Like the suit would prevent you from going to the bathroom while wearing it? No, the, but the system did provide a lot of nutrients, so I didn't have to eat a whole lot. I might eat every two to three days, and it was just some type of sludge that was supposedly all the vitamins I needed. But the system provided a lot of those vitamins uh, on its own, so I didn't have to eat very often. I did still go to the bathroom, uh, both urinate and defecate maybe like two to three times a week. And, but the but the way the suit would work is that it literally a hole would open up where I was going to the restroom, and uh, it would just expand and open up, and there'd be an oval there. Okay. And then it would close back over the top after I was done. So you didn't make bio waste products every day. So it was like two to three oh. weeks. Yeah, yeah. It was like it, once or you know once or er, once or twice, maybe three times a week at the most. So the the smart suit had some kind of a technology in it, probably nanotechnology, to sort of um, regulate your 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 bathroom cycle, so you wouldn't have to go every day. Correct, and it fed me nutrients, so I didn't have to eat very often. Yeah, because when I was on the planetary corporations at the Mars bases or otherwise it's called interplanetary corporate conglomerate. Um, yes. They were building smart suits that while you wear the smart suit, you don't have to go to the bathroom. Somehow your molecular bodily functions and molecular structure are um, changed. So you don't have to wear, you don't have to go to the bathroom while wearing the suit. And the suit could also mimic clothing, different kinds of colors, shapes, fabrics, material. It could look like any type of clothing, the suit itself. Mm -hmm. And it could, it could cloak too. I mean, it could go completely invisible. Yeah. Um, were you any, were you at any of the base facilities, Dark Fleet bases or cities? Um, um, we only came into port twice during the whole time, and, um, you know, it was, they were set up to be kind of like a carnival-esque, uh, situation. Um, it, it was, the, the ones we went to were a celebratory, uh, base. It was just made to be a big party. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wasn't impressed. I didn't like it at all. I felt it was, because I was not a part of the same system of the vampiric, uh, religious system they believed in, so I didn't find, none of it was palatable to me, you know? Like, I didn't find any of it even mildly uh, appealing. Yeah, because in Dark Fleet, there's, there are individuals who are vamp energy vampires, and they drain you of energy. Right. And they encourage that system. It's, it's part of, like, a religious system that they push on most people. Yeah, the assets. Um, did you ever see dome domed facilities that where it's glass like domes that have holographic technology that cloak the dome itself and any facility that is under the dome? Um, it, it, there was a couple on desert planets that they had set up that way, but they had them set up over rocky encroachments that uh, produced uh, water. Um. And then there was uh, one on a there was one on one of the asteroids that they had done that way. Most of the time, they had done it on the inside of asteroids uh, to provide all sorts of extra shielding. But there was a couple of asteroids they needed it on the outside for to service much larger ships. So on the surface of the asteroids themselves. Correct. Yes. And, and these domes have like electromagnetic field shielding so it could make these domes invisible so they can't be seen by satellite or radar out from space and they also deflect asteroids meteorites and space debris and space junk as well to protect whatever facility is inside the domes yes i'd assume so um 
I, I mean, I, I don't know that level of information about them, but I'd have to assume that's that's what it was like. I just knew that the only way I could get inside is if they showed me a picture of it and I could uh, portal there. And then um, my suit had a system that was set up with many raids and also situations like that. Like if they needed uh, technicians on the actual uh, platform to do uh, some type of uh, corroboration or something, uh, collaboration, um, I'd open up portals like in the docking bay and they would come through there. And they, they had set uh, tracks ready to move things through on these portals that would open up in the docking bay when I'd open them. So your main job was to be a teleporter for creating yep. portals and transporting yourself and others. Correct. Like a tel like a, a teleport operator, I'd show up first. I'd ask them what they were looking for, if it was any different than what I was told to do, and um, I'd confer, and then the portals would open, and they'd come through. And for time travel, you could also open a time travel portal, go in yourself, and take somebody else with you, or take things with you? Um, it took time. Um, in the beginning, when I was killing, when, when I was just stopping uh, assassins from killing people, or I was um, uh, saving someone from some uh, accident that would kill them, I could only bring myself and my suit. And then over time, I got over time they got to where they could send, they had allies that would give me things in the past or where I was going and then later I could bring my own objects with me it took a while yeah because it takes a lot of psychic energy to maintain teleportation and time travel portals right oh yeah oh man um, but a lot of it was that I don't know. It was like the rage that I had in me from the horrible situation that allowed me to do some of the time dilations to escape for periods of time. Just the absolute rebellious rage that I had from the experiences that I had on the ship that allowed me to uh, time dilate back to the Earth and experience uh, times in the past before our uh, known history. And when I was in the secret space program, I was in the quantum time leap time travel program th through the planetary corporations or the interplanetary corporate conglomerate, however you want to call it. So we could time dilate between our normal earth timeline and at the same time create like a energetic bridge and do the Mars SSP asset timeline. And time moved differently on Earth than on Mars because with time dilation, you say like maybe an hour has passed on Earth and several years have passed on Mars when you're an asset. Yes, it's it's a little bit more fluid for someone with a suit. Uh, and what they, they termed mine as organic time travel in that it stayed on the primary timeline and that it was very um, organic in that it didn't break or uh, create branches of timelines very often at all. Uh, they always, it, like, the, like the leads of a vine, if they had nothing to attach to, then they would wrap back around the center vine. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that respect, I was very lucky in that there wasn't a lot of traceable effects from me time dilating to the past for my little excursions in between missions. And how is your health? Has there been any impact from the Dark Fleet missions? The, how is your health overall? Because I know so, some of the Secret Space Program experiencers and assets, they have poor health neurological deficits, disabilities, and other things from time traveling and from the being re age regressed. Have you encountered anything like that? Um, I've managed to stay very young for a very long period of time. Uh, I still fit into the clothes I've had since I was a teenager, and I have remained the same level of fitness, same level of health. Um, but like uh, many... SSP assets when age uh, 
regressed back to a younger age. It's like they put this thing, this the, this program in that gives you worse eyesight. Mm-hmm. Um, I've noticed a lot of SSP assets I've talked to over the years all have bad eyesight. It's like they cursed us with it when they age regressed us. <laughs> but um, other than that, that's about it. So you've experienced the eyesight issues as well, or you're you're in perfect health. Eyesight issues, um, I bounce back and forth. It's weird. Some days I'll have great eyesight and some days I won't. Yeah, and I've experienced the same thing. Um, Sometimes uh, very blurry double vision, you know, can't see clearly long distance. And other days it's perfect spotless and there's no problem. And I I can see perfectly from a distance. And it's really tough when you got contacts because there's some days where you don't even need them. Yeah, and I don't wear glasses or contacts, even though though I can't see perfectly long distance. I uh, just to do, try to do focus exercises with my eyes to help yeah. improve my eyesight that way naturally. Because I yeah. it's just hard on me to wear glasses and contacts, so I I avoid that. Um, and that's common. The eyesight issues, uh, bone de- degeneration, neurological brain problems, memory problems. Um, that's I haven't I've- had any memory problems, but um, I've noticed uh, that uh, as of late, it has been more of a challenge than I expected. And I, 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 I worried about this happening as I got into my 30s because I knew that many SSP assets – stay young for a long period of time and then just age really quickly. And um, so, like, I'm waiting for that shoe to drop if it does, you know. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've looked the same ever since I was, like, 18 years old. My looks haven't changed that much physically. Um, it's like um, Ileana Forever Young type of deal, but uh, I know the shoe does drop another areas for me health wise quite often so um and that's from a lot of the time traveling the age regression and being used for wear and tear on missions yeah who knows i mean like i could have been gone for a week and i just slept one night and who knows how long i aged while i was gone you know what i mean yeah exactly because with time travel anything is almost possible like you can do anything with it well, and people don't realize, um, I guess it was probably like a year ago, I was hijacked for, for some type of attack on whales in the Pacific Ocean. And I mean, it was a, it was a um, horrific situation. And um, I don't know why, but I was the one person they could use to track them down. And I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I was on a fanciful uh you know, jaunt out to have an experience with whales. And the next thing I knew, they'd captured them all and were slicing them apart on ships. And, um, you know, there's, you never know. You never know what you're going to be used for. And and, and you you have no warning ahead of time, you know. Exactly. They just abduct you or take you against your will on different missions and you're just supposed to cooperate or else they'll... They'll threaten you with um, unimaginable pain and punishment, and you're or just stuck your there. Your astral body while you're traveling. The next thing you know, you've been pushed over an area, and you're being subjected to, you know, you know they've tuned you into the sounds of a specific thing, and you're attracted to it because it's a positive entity. The next thing you know, those things are getting destroyed. Exactly. You know, you don't, you don't, you have no clue uh, when or where. Uh, and so you've got to be very careful and very guarded. And um, you, you tend to start practicing going into your astral body when you sleep with purpose so that it can't happen. And then shielding yourself as you do it so that uh, they can't interject into what your plan is. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because they could physically. The other thing you can do as an asset is go into sleep without a plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like you said, they just shoot your body into doing something, your physical body or even your soul, and uh, you're just in it, I guess, doing whatever they want you to do. Right. Because your body has been shot into it out of your sleep 
out of your dream state and you do have to when you before you go to sleep you have to put in the intent these groups such factions they will not take me they won't use me against my will and you have to put the shielding around yourself and when you're in the astral you also have to protect yourself and just be guarded correct and um it, you know having a plan uh keeping close connection with the factions that you're involved with and um, having a plan for what y you're going to be doing as you sleep is very useful because it kind of prevents a lot of uh, the sneaky tricks they like to use to get you off your tracks. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about or give perspective on? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I've been working a lot lately on the Earth and inner Earth situations, and I did I did uh, actually talk about this in my last uh, interview. Um, the audio was kind of uh, loud and obnoxious. I apologize. I don't know where it came from. But uh, I, I, I would like to suggest that people do take a look at the high vibration areas in their life in nature. And uh, take a moment to really enjoy that and realize that that connects you to the earth and extra dimensional beings that you might not have ever considered even exist. But are there uh, positive ones? And um, as the energy level continues to increase on earth, uh, for some of us who are um, already uh, working on our much higher energies, you can see it. Uh, if you're, if you're good at seeing auras, you'll notice that the sky is, uh, is hard not to see as a rainbow these days. Um, and that colors are more vibrant. And that it's really much easier to be positive and excited about the world around you. Um, <clears throat> but if you, can do, if you can do all those things, you should definitely seek out the higher energy and vibrational areas of nature. Because it will connect you to positive extra dimensional beings uh, that will be there to help you um, and uh, I, I just recommend that you, uh, you you give you give that a chance hug some trees walk in the grass get positive energy and get balanced mm -hmm. um, grounding the energy from the sun uh, uh, to trees is uh, very helpful just laying face down and pouring your heart out into the earth, giving all of your pain and loss to the earth. Um, and keep in mind, it's not gone forever. It's being transmuted into something more positive, and it can come back to you whenever you need it. But letting go of it makes you lighter and increases the energy within inside of you and your vibration. Um, so I definitely recommend doing that. Um, and then also finding high vibrational areas of nature. To connect to. And I've noticed this trend among um, people asking us for proof and evidence. Like you were here, you were there, you were on these missions, but you have no photos, you have no video, you have no physical proof. And, and some people, they, when they come out talking about their experiences, they don't go under their first name or last name. They have specific names that they use for their interviews and stuff that have a meaning to them like mine is Ileana yours is Meta and some of us don't do full-on um video right we do right. audio like why and I mean kudos to those who can who can put their face and their real name to it I'm not ready to do that yet but kudos to people like Simon Parks and others that really can um and, you know, I love them for everything they're worth, but I, I can't, I'm not there yet. There's too much in my life that could go wrong if I uh, exposed myself. Exactly. And it's also about um, just protect, protecting your, your soul, your, your reputation as well. And just because we're not showing our face or we're using a... A different name online for these interviews it doesn't mean we're not telling the truth or that our experiences are not genuine it's just that um for certain reasons it's to protect your to protect your reputation to protect yourself your family 
And I highly respect that. To me, I don't have to see your face or, right. or know your 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 name, right? You keep be using a pseudonym, um, and or or a name that's close to your heart, whatever, to do these mm -hmm. interviews. So it's it's it doesn't say that there is a lack of evidence or proof. It just shows that you're being careful in how you're putting out your information and your disclosure. Yeah. And I mean, like, I kind of followed Cobra's lead on that one. And um, I, I mean, even though, I mean, like, it, it, I mean, others, others who are in that same market, like, let's say uh, Corey Good, um, he was more uh, uh, avant garde about it and put his face to it. And he's had way more attacks than Cobra. Me not putting my face to it, I've still had two and two severe ones, two ones that I had to re absolutely uh, re weaponize my entire spiritual abilities and defense abilities to combat severe, uh, like nothing I've seen before. I uh, took control of my body for a, a good five seconds. I've never had an entity take control of my body. Um, and uh, it only happened after I started doing interviews. Um, and uh, so, yeah. I mean, like, I completely understand why people don't want to put their entire, you know, uh, persona on Front Street, <laughs> if you yeah. will. Yeah, I mean, you're, you can be attacked with energy beam weapons. You could be attacked with uh, Voice of God technology. You know, they could try to uh, expose you as a liar or fake and whatnot if they know your name. Old time. AI for me, but that's because I didn't put my name to it. Who knows what would have happened then? Exactly. And um, we can become targeted individuals for life when you come forward with your full name or when you're even thinking about coming out with information, they could read your mind because they spy on us. They have the technology to spy on us through, th through satellites, uh, tapping it's hard for them. It's hard for them to read our minds in particular we've had so many years of our minds being read and keeping our own personal secrets and finding our own little, little ways to get around the mind control. And I mean, keep in mind, a lot of us were shot continuously if we thought the wrong things mm -hmm. and we found ways to think the wrong things without getting shocked. Yeah. You know what I mean? So for us, they really cannot read our minds like they can a normal person's mind. Yeah. Because um, we have shielding now, now that we oh, are aware yeah. of what's going on. And like Pavlov's dog, we were trained. We were literally shocked until we found a way to think it without getting shocked. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and um, so it's, it's just not the same for us when it comes to thinking things, but uh, words that come out of our mouths are definitely, uh, you know, up for grabs. So when we do these interviews and we speak these words, it, it, it puts a red flag on us. Yeah. And in terms of providing physical evidence, like video, audio, um, written, like written information from in roads recently, uh, I believe the federal government and the CIA is getting sued at this time for MK ultra experiments. Yes. And are lawyers actually taking names for that? Yeah. I would think that they might have more information about programs than we are personally privy to. And that it would, and, and I mean, I, I think it's a little preliminary, and it, it might, might be even be dangerous to put your name up on it, but um, I think there's going to be more people connected to it, and there's more sites that they have recorded than what they're letting on to. Yeah. And this kind of the times, and it could very well lead to a much larger floodgate opening. Yeah. We need, we need a lot of disclosure to come out about MKUltra, the Monarch program or Monarch program, um, other oh. mind control brainwashing programs. There's tons of them. Tons. There's so many. I mean, if it, you look back into the Montauk project, and that was spread across the country in the, in, in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s is when it went national. And um, it was spread to every last psychological institution in the country. And uh, primarily it was set up in Seattle and Chicago and those northern uh, states. Um, it's, uh, and, and I mean, it, it, it's been spread everywhere. Anyone who was ever uh, institutionalized 
uh, for mental problems has had some sort of mo uh, monarch uh, MK Ultra programming, whether they realize it or not. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I recently interviewed Jason Brown, who has the Neo Illuminati website, and he was talking about the monarch programs and how they could do time travel and that the original monarchs were from Mars, that they came from Mars to Earth. Yeah, I don't know. I think that one is, uh, I think it's kind of a, a story they like to push. The, the, you have to understand the global elite, uh, their bloodline came from Mars and they arrived in Atlantis way before the fall. And then they systematically, slowly but surely, took over uh, and indoctrinated their more masculine belief system upon Atlantis. Um, and, I mean, like, if you want to follow the elite's form of disclosure, they're going to talk about ancient, you know, artifacts and uh, encampments in Antarctica and DNA bloodlines that lead to the Rothschilds and how... The, the 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 old the, their their uh, their DNA is superior to everyone else's because of these specific things, and they have the ability to travel through time, and we don't. But the reality is, we all do. We all have this, and that um, it, it comes from diversity, and, and not from any type of eugenics program where the bloodline was purified, if you will. Yeah, and Jason, the the Neo Illuminati site, it's not about even the elites. It's just um, he calls it the enlightened ones learning information. So he doesn't mean like Illuminati, Illuminati. He's right, right. But I I, I just have to uh, personally, I believe that everyone is capable of that. They just don't realize it yet, and that the reality is is that we'll all have special gifts, but we'll also all have the metagene that allows us to recreate our own reality as we see fit. I agree with that. And in terms of like people asking us for comments on interviews, like where's your evidence? Where, where's your photographs of these smart suits? Where's your video audio that you've been off planet on ships? Like, why can't we provide that evidence? Do you have an opinion on that or why we can't? Well, I mean, it's it's clear that it's all been recorded. Um, it, it's clear that, I mean, that I mean, honestly, uh, w when I when I switched sides, when I went double agent and started working for the light, and I had my third nodal point, and I split into three different timelines. Um, that the, they the, they had a link to me before I split into those three different timelines. Um, there's, I mean, there's entities that that know everything about every space program we've ever had, you know, and um, they're all a part of this uh, this grand awakening that we're having. And um, so, I would expect at the end that there not to be any secrets left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, like, as far as I can say, um, I mean, like, th there is a, an above 40,000 feet that is uh, definitely an extremely major player in our world progression. And to pretend like that eventually everything won't come to light is uh, probably foolhardy. But until then, we'll just have to talk about it. Yeah, and in terms of being allowed to bring with us video and audio and, and photographs, most of these programs don't allow us to do that. We come of back. Not. Yeah, of course not. No, we come back with the clothes on our back, and that's what we're allowed to keep. Sometimes we don't even come back in the exact same body. Yeah, that's most true. No, they alter our DNA on return. I have to believe that. Yeah, yeah, so you, you might come back a different uh, personality or a different altar of yourself or a different timeline self, even version, slight version of yourself, and you reintegrate all of that together. Right, and then there's years worth of abductions and programming and mind wiping that they use to keep you complacent until you reach puberty and your hormones take over and you tend to forget more about it during that time. Yeah, that's true. You know, when you're in your teens, you're just uh, kind of 
concentrating on finishing elementary school, high school, then going to college, going to university, doing the nine to five job, trying to But establish I, yourself in the world. Da 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 da. I would I would definitely say that if you can remember abductions from you know five to like ten to twelve weird times where you probably might have been abducted you were probably in an ssp and they were doing their um you know they were shoring up that wall to prevent you from remembering until you hit your puberty um and a lot of people will remember the abductions but they won't remember the service and um you know you it, it'll just take a little bit of time you have to keep on going farther back And some of those farthest back memories of abductions are more painful, but you'll reach the point to where you remember what it was you were you were being made to forget. Exactly, and there's the extraterrestrial abduction experiences, the uh, extraterrestrial contact experiences, the SSP abductions, and the service part of it. There's so much involved. It's all the the I believe that the secret space programs are con are interconnected with the human personnel running the secret space programs and the extraterrestrial um, beings also oh, yeah. associated no, it, with the programs. No, it's, it's a top down situation where even after you're back, they're still experimenting and using your DNA, and they they want to make clones of you that can be used for their specific uh, future plans and things like that, and. Uh, sometimes they might be using your soul or trying to insert portions of your soul, taking portions of your soul, or um, inserting other people's soul into your DNA, uh, uh, you know, uh, a suit of your DNA, basically, a human body of your DNA with a different soul in it. Yeah. And, um, you know, these are all different programs that they explore after you've returned from an SSP or you're just a human on the on the planet. Yep, and also they make a cyborgs where they use partial body parts and they infuse it with cybernetic technology. So you basically become, your soul is input into the cyborg and now you're a functioning synth cyborg being or they could do genetic manipulation on you. You were human, now you become a human extraterrestrial hybrid all of a sudden in these right. programs. <laughs> Or some type of chimera, because there's a lot of those experiments of, because you have to, I mean, many different alien races uh, have their background in different species, even on this planet, and um, uh, some of them are in different stages of the eugenic situation, where they have to find a more di a diversified version of themselves to continue to progress. And we've got that metagene that everybody wants, which is one of the reasons why our society just can't be removed. Uh, a lot of different races don't have that metagene, and they want it. And, um, you know, you just look at the biodiversity of this planet, and you have to understand that we're kind of like an Akashic record for DNA here. And there's really no place like us, um, which is why we're a hot topic. Yeah, like a literal living library of genetics. Exactly. Everybody wants a part of what the Earth has. Yeah, and I when I was Because on the... Species uplift and terraforming is the currency of the universe. In in the civilized universe, <laughs> that's, that's the currency. So basically terraformation and transformation of species and planets, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, uplifting a species to sentience and and uh, eventually giving it the ability to completely uh, live on its own is a, a currency, a very powerful currency in the universe. And um, uh, so is terraforming of planets and progression of species upon the planet. And um, so, I mean, like, th that's another reason why they, even the very best species don't, I mean, alien species don't want to give up the ghost, because once they have to admit that we're completely sentient, and that we deserve our own place at the table, um, they lose a lot of the rights to all the DNA on the planet, and we then receive all the rights. And I, I remember when I was on the Mars bases with the Planetary Corporations or the ICC, 
that they would alter my genetics and make me look like humanoid extraterrestrials for a temporary period of time for negotiations, for talks, whatever meetings with extraterrestrials. I would look like human-like extraterrestrials because they did not, the other extraterrestrials whose form I would take, they don't, they didn't want to see human uh, SSP personnel. They wanted to see a version of themselves come to the meeting. Otherwise, yep. they wouldn't let you in. Yep, and they did that on my ship too, especially when we would capture a ship and use the distress beacon. They would uh, leave a skeleton crew that had been tortured and programmed to act a certain way and do certain things. But they would always take one human from our uh, from our ship and genetically alter them to be like the aliens and put them on the ship as the overseer to make sure no one uh, stepped out of their programming. Yeah, for me, it was temporary looking like a humanoid extraterrestrial because they'd give me drug serums, genetic modification, uh, like the nanotech or something similar. And then you'd, you'd look in the mirror and you're like, wow, I look like a humanoid extraterrestrial. I, they could change body mass, shape, hair, they had skin a holographic, color. Yeah, they had a holographic like uh, facial reconstruction system with us. Uh, that you would just sit there and um, it, they would scan an alien as long as they keep the alien still, they'd scan it. And then it, you would be sitting in a seat next to them and it would reconstruct your face or body to look just like them. Mm -hmm. And um, it was it, it was kind of an all-in-one thing in that it would uh, extract, it would collect DNA from them and then it would uh, inject some type of serum into you that would change it for you your DNA, and then um, sometimes they'd have to wait two or three hours for it to completely take, and then you'd be on the ship. Of course, it was extremely dangerous. Things went wrong. Uh, the programming didn't always work. Um, the person who was the overseer got shot multiple times. Um, after part of the programming had gone through, the SOS, the, the, you know, the SOS was sent or whatever. Um, but yeah, no, they did that lot on our ships yeah and for me it was temporary looking like a humanoid extraterrestrial it was never permanent because i and i always refused to look anything other than a humanoid extraterrestrial i didn't want four legs and four arms or to look like an octopus i, I only or agreed slug or something <laughs> yeah i only agreed to look humanoid extraterrestrial i had certain types of boundaries that i did not want to cross because it would be shocking to the system to see yourself as an octopus, for example. Well, you're lucky because those people didn't have any choice on our ship. They, and I mean, like, yeah, they'd bring you back to your normal self if they could when you came back. But some people were just kind of screwed sometimes. Like, there was something about certain alien DNAs that didn't let go after it was a part of you. Yeah, there, there was that... Um, but on the Mars basis, for some reason, it was always temporary. And for for me, I, I at least had a choice of the humanoid extraterrestrial with two arms, two legs, two eyes. Never any extra appendages or never anything beyond the humanoid looking ETs. Yeah, my skin color would look different sometimes, like blue, like blue, pale, white or something. Uh, different hair color, eye color, skin color, height, shape, body mass. I could, I'm five foot five, but um, sometimes I would be like up to 10 feet or taller, depending mm -hmm. on what um, ET genetics they gave me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were some species they could exchange souls into, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you could just kind of take over the body of an alien being, um, but those, that wasn't, that, that was more rare than you would you know, yeah, because that was the easiest way to do it, but that was much more rare. It had to be certain type of extremely psychic uh, aliens that you could do that with. Yeah, just Im imagine your soul is suddenly in some alien body. You don't know the physiology or the molecular structure of how to power that body while you're in it psychically. So it's hard yeah. to power it because you're not familiar with that species of ET. At all. Right. Weird things happen. Mm -hmm. Especially if they had psychic ability, you know, very powerful psychic abilities, you know, um, all sorts of things happen. Things would fly across the room for no reason. 
Yeah, you'd um, be in unfamiliar territory because the body is totally different, and you're like suddenly injected into your soul is injected into that ET body, and you're like shocked because you didn't expect that to happen. You weren't right. trained for it. Right, and you didn't understand the tools that new body had. Yeah, that that new body did have. Or you wouldn't right. even know if you would be your soul would be returned back into your original body at the end of a mission. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, if, if they can call more, sh like in our situation, if you were transferred to a different body and you were the overseer of a ship that had sent an SOS to call in other ships and it worked and you got the second ship, you might get put on the next ship to do it again. You know what I mean? And who knows? You, you might be doing that until they blew up the ship you were on, and then you were gone. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's tough, tough situation, tough services being a, an asset. Right. Yeah. So um, would you like to share anything else? Um, I think that's all for now. We did a really good job tonight. I'm really happy with this interview. Yeah, me too. So thank you so much for joining us, Meta, and we look forward to doing another chat with you soon. Thank you. I had a blast. I look forward to the next one. Thank you. Me too. Have a good night. Me too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.